Hi, this is Jose Lana, and welcome to the Theater Podcast with Alan Sales. Hey everyone, welcome to an all new episode of the Theater Podcast with Alan Seals. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and our guest today is Jose Lana, who is currently in Here Lies Love on the Broadway stage in the Broadway Theater. Very meta, if you ask me. Uh, This episode turned into an incredibly deep history lesson. I had no clue... Uh, because, I mean, we get into the reasons why typically uh, a lot of people in America don't understand the international history that's going on in the Philippines or the things that are happening in the Philippines, whether it be history or current events, because history seems to be repeating itself. Uh, Jose is so passionate about his family and their past, and it's just all shown through the chat and, and just the representation that he gets to bring to um, to his heritage, to his family, and to what's going on, again, currently in the Philippines. It's just incredible. Can't wait to share this episode. Find me online, Instagram. Uh, I think I've given up on Twitter, X, whatever. If you still need me there, let me know, but I think I'm done with it. So Instagram, TikTok, threads, hit me up. Let me know uh, that you're listening and everybody now enjoy this episode with Jose Lana. Here you go. One, two, three. Today's guest has been gracing the Broadway stage now for over two decades, having appeared in both the 1996 and 2015 revivals of The King and I. He has also appeared in Rent, Street Corner Symphony, Flower Drum Song, Wonderland, Spelling Bee, which earned him a Drama Desk Award. Uh, TV and film credits include Sex and the City, Hitch, and Unconscious, and he can now be seen tearing up the dance floor on the Broadway stage again as President Marcos in Here Lies Love. Jose Lana, welcome to the Theater Podcast. Thank you for having me. So I on these episodes, I often will get into um, what I will call the basic information of like, where did you grow up? What got you into theater and all this stuff. But the where did you grow up is taking us straight into, I think, a much deeper conversation. So uh, let's let's kind of start with that. And I'll let you set the stage. No pun intended as to like uh, how that all began. Okay. Um, well, I was born in the Philippines. I was born, uh, my sis, my sis, older sister and I were born in the, the mid-70s in the, in the Philippines and during martial law. And um, it was became very clear to my parents, uh, who were hot-blooded activists um, against martial law, that it was not a great place to raise their kids. So um, uh, they tried very hard to find jobs in America. My mom found one first, and uh, we moved to New York City in 79. Um, And then a year later, we moved to Virginia. Um, So I grew up in a suburb of Washington, D.C., and that's where I grew up. Like uh, Fairfax area? Yeah, Fairfax County, exactly. Fairfax County, uh, Springfield, Virginia. Springfield, Virginia is where I grew up. And uh, I'm a product of the public school system of Northern Virginia, Um, Proud, very proudly. Uh, Went to a math and science high school, magnet school, TJ, Thomas Jefferson High School. And then I made my way to New York City. So math and science high school automatically means you're good at singing and dancing and acting, right? Of course, of course. Actually, I, I always say I lucked out. My, my senior year in high school in particular, we, um, you know, math and science, math in particular is very connected to music. Music, people who are good at math, uh, music makes sense. There's a lot of rules and, and um, there's a lot of connection between music and, and science, and, to be honest. And so, um, but uh, I benefited greatly that my sister was older than me. And uh, she did everything right. She went to all the engineering schools. She got a full scholarship at MIT and became a badass engineer. Wow! Which allowed, um, which allowed her little brother to be the art artist in the family. Um, <laughs> like, like we got one. The other one can do what they want. <laughs> absolutely. And I always say, if my sister and I were born in different orders, I'd be the engineer and she'd be on Broadway uh, and singing and dancing. Did she so, ever have any any desire, inclination to follow that path either? You know, it's weird. I, 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 I know that sometimes, you know, like whenever she sees my shows, I mean, she's the most supportive sister on the planet. She'll always want to talk about the dancers. You know, she was a dancer in high school and um, you know, and who knows, you know, but like I said, it, it's hard to even say like how, how different would I be if I were born first and I had the weight of responsibility that immigrant parents place on the first born child. And, um, my sister got all of that and, uh, I was given free reign to do whatever I wanted. So, uh, it's, it's the, 
the 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 privilege of the younger siblings that get to be the artists. So. Yeah, my my younger brother, he got to get away with everything. I always joke around <laughs> that, that I, I broke in my parents for my brother. Absolutely, it's always it's actually very true. Yeah, because by the time by the time he got caught sneaking in late at night, they were like, oh, "Okay, this is what kids do. That's fine." Because absolutely, I, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But at what point, though? I mean, you obviously there's there's very strong tie over between math and music and dancing because mm-hmm. it's you know it's rhythm and counts and and things like this. Um, but at what point were you? Was there a touchstone or a moment when you're like, "I'm going to try to do this." professionally i want to keep going or or was it like just accepting opportunity after opportunity you know i mean i i think i'm the typical story of well not i don't want to say typical but like the filipinos are born with a karaoke mic in their hands you know everyone sings at gatherings everyone yeah. is a singer you know and so i grew up singing just like and my dad uh, i grew up listening to my dad sing on his with his guitar in the living room every saturday and sunday morning on the weekends and uh, and then the karaoke machines would come out during family gatherings and Filipino gatherings. And then in high school, really in middle school, I discovered musical theater. I discovered Broadway. And there was kind of no turning back at that point. And um, I think uh, a major, and you can't understate the importance of Leia Salonga winning the Tony Award mm. for, for Miss Saigon in 1990. I was a... Um, I was actually when it when, when is she when 89 90 um uh, I was in middle school high school during that time you know and I was just beginning to get obsessed with musical theater I was obsessed with Les Mis I was obsessed with Miss Saigon and to watch Leia Salonga win this award um it propelled a lot of people like myself who were Filipinos to go maybe I can go to New York and I'm like one of my goals was to get into Miss Saigon and and and, and I, the fact that I never got into Miss Saigon is is uh, and that other shows happened first. Um, but I think that was definitely a touchstone. And, and then I, you know, 10 years later, I would end up working with Leia and, 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 and now working with Leia again and here lies love, you know? So I think, um, you can't understate how important it was that Leia, uh, Salonga put Filipinos on kind of the global map uh, at that point in terms of singers. And, um, I very much came to New York with, a, with that kind of inspiration. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I got very lucky. I, I came into New York City at a time when um, rock and roll and, and, and contemporary musical theater was beginning to hit. And um, and I think the fact that I my career has kind of bounced between legit legit theater and rock theater. Um, and, and it was just the music that I grew up with. And, and I was able to straddle both uh, kind of at, at the beginning of my career. Uh, it gave me a versatility that was really helpful in auditioning. Like I could go from the King and I to go do Rent, uh, back to Flower Drum Song, um, and then Wonderland. You know, so it's I think uh, and Street Corner Symphony was like a Motown review. So I mean, um, I just tried to sing whatever was put in front of me. You know it's fascinating, I mean? I, and I I didn't ultimately um, realize how, how strong the connection was between the Filipino culture and and karaoke until actually it was mentioned in Here Lies Love, right? Absolutely. Which is kind of the basis behind the whole set design in the first place. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's, it's weird. Like growing up as a Filipino, you know, it's, you don't think about it. It's because it's, it's, it's just a fact. Everyone sings, everyone, you know, the karaoke machine is there at every party. And, and, um, and, and, and it's not even, it's not even, it's, it, there's a level of showing off. Like who's the best, who are the better <laughs> singers? Like, and, and every family always has like their best singers and, and every family has like the shame of like, uh, Uncle Roy can't sing, you know, it's like, it, there, there's, there's that, there's that shame. Right. But, um, I remember being a little kid and being annoyed that my uncles were, were stealing all the good cassette tapes with all the boys, with all the male songs. Um, and they wouldn't, let, <laughs> they wouldn't let the kids have them. And so I remember like the first couple of songs I sang in karaoke were like Whitney Houston songs. Cause all, they weren't any boy songs left. Cause all my uncles were saving it for themselves. No, I mean, I think karaoke, well, first of all, I grew up with, uh, calling it minus one. A lot of Filipinos call it minus one as opposed to karaoke. I've never uh, heard minus, that. Yeah, minus one, is, you, you, you would buy minus one cassette tapes and it meant it was minus one track. You minus the vocal track. Minus so, the singer, yeah. Yeah, so you might, so, and so um, I grew up singing minus one and then even and when, by the time I got to high school, people were like, you guys do a lot of karaoke. I'm like, what's karaoke? You know, and <laughs> Filipinos, a lot of Filipinos I grew up with, we call it minus one and, um, and so it's it's it makes sense, you know. You know those 
those books that that uh, that give advice to international business people. It's like in in Japan, you hand your you hand your business card like this, and you present it. And in certain different countries, that you have to go by their traditions and their cultures. The business advice usually is if you are doing business in in the Philippines, you will eventually be asked to go to dinner and have, and then the karaoke machine will come out. Do not refuse to sing, or else you will be seen as someone who is conceited. Wow! Like every, but and that's kind of true. It's like when people people pass around the karaoke mic, it's like, right, everyone has everyone sing something, um, and I think that's a part of the, the culture of. Um, it, no one makes a fool of themselves. Every if if you do, then it's okay. That means we're all going to make fun of each other, and there's a there's a beautiful familial feeling about that. And um, and if you're nervous about singing, it's okay. Get over it, and we'll and we're all going to feel silly, you know. But, and I think that's a beautiful part of the culture. Do you have a go-to karaoke song where it's just like someone throws the mic at you? Now everything's digital at your fingertips. You're like, all right, call up such and such from this. You know, it's funny. Filipinos, when are, well, you're, we're never caught off guard when they ask, what's your go-to karaoke song? I have like three. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, depending on different decades of my life, you know, and um, and, and they, people always keep that 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 song in the back of their head that they know that they can whip out and, and get the crowd going. And, and, and depending on the on the crowd, it's like, I don't want to show off. I don't want to. How about a fun song to pick everybody up? You got to build it up a little bit. So what do you start with? Like energy's kind of medium. Everyone's a little, this is America. So everyone is uh, a little bit trepidatious. They're embarrassed. So how do you get it going? What do you go to? Well, I always go to like my middle school and high school songs. I always go to like George Michael, Freedom 90 or, or, or Belle Biv DeVoe's Poison. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like silly songs that everyone's like, oh my God, I know that song. Let's sing along, you know, or like the the really cheesy love ballads from the 80s, like Peter Cetera, like, you know, from Karate Kid 2, you know, um, things like that. I mean, like, again, it's I my goal for karaoke is to have fun and be silly, not necessarily to show off how great a singer I am. And I think that's that's the fun part of karaoke. I wish that corporate America, a key emphasis on America would would incorporate this uh, this tradition <laughs> because I was I was it was two weeks ago I was at a business event and karaoke was brought out by the singers in the group okay. and and they there were managers who didn't sing and the, you know people who aren't just aren't used to it and so they like it was so painful to watch. <laughs> to watch them a try to refuse but then they were like fine 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 and caving into peer pressure and then picking songs that were so inappropriate not only for them but for the corp the corp yeah like one of my managers picked uh baby got back which if you actually look at those lyrics they're not right not not for corporate not for corporate yeah, know your audience know your know your know your audience and know your lyrics yeah i think that's that's the lesson um and then but the family though uh ha, has your family been able to come see here lies love oh absolutely they they saw it a bunch of times down when we were at the public and uh and my and they were all there for opening night my mom my dad my stepdad my stepmom my sister her husband the kids and um no they they've been very much my first of all my family and i are very close like yeah I, it's, it's it's just my mom, my dad, my sister, and me. And then my parents got divorced when I was ten, and they're both remarried. And I'm very close to my stepdad and my stepmom, and so I have a large family. Um, my mom and dad have always been super, super supportive of their art artist younger younger uh, child. Um, and this show has been very cathartic for all of us. You know, I think, um, like I said, we came here to escape martial law, yeah. and but my parents. Uh, you know, the, the, the Filipino Americans are, are are one of two are 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 either one of two camps. You either come here and you leave everything behind because Filipinos are the are the masters of assimilation. You know, you said we're going to be we're going to be Americans now. We're not going to speak Filipino and Tagalog at home. Uh, our kids are going to be raised here and they're going to not have accents, and we're just going to move forward. And that's okay. Like that's that's a lot of people. A lot of people do that and filipinos are very good at assimilating my parents were of the were of the other camp where they 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 kept a very filipino household they spoke tagalog at home my sister and i grew up understanding tagalog and and we have a hard time speaking it now just we're not immersed in it but but if someone is speaking tagalog to me i'll completely understand what they're saying which Hmm. i'm so grateful for but the most important thing they did was 
they raised my sister and me with the full knowledge of why we left the Philippines, that it was not, that it was, that was, it was a hard choice and, and what martial law was and what we were watching on the TV, the news reports that we were watching and explaining what it was about. Uh, you know, cause we were in my suburban living room in Virginia watching all the protest rallies and watching Ninoy Aquino flying home to the Philippines in 1983 and watching the assassination and understanding why that was horrible. And um, the image of him on the tarmac was, you know, was burned in my brain as a kid. And so, um, you know, when I told them that I was going to be a part of this musical 12 years ago, 11 years ago, this workshop of a new musical, um, they were, they, they were, they were a little suspicious. They were like, why, uh, you know, and I, but first of all, I, I, I thought I wanted to, I, I came into this audition thinking I wanted to go play a Ninoy. I, I walked into that audition room and, and demanded to be seen for a Ninoy Aquino so I could make my parents proud that I was going to play this hero. Hmm. Um, and, you know, and I wanted to work with David and I wanted to work with Alex and, I, and obviously had the public too. And I guess my author authoritative voice demanding to play Nino, I made them think maybe this guy may be better playing the president. Well, no, we'll see. Um, so from day one working on the show, my parents and I have had an open conversation about it. And I, I made it very clear to the production and to the creative team that if we ever veered in a direction of glorifying the Marcuses and presenting them in any positive light that I was going to walk away from the project. And they respected that. And hmm. They went the completely other direction. They say, you know, tell us about your family. Tell us about your your parents. You know, um, that that then we can maybe n help shape this piece and and know what we want to say with this piece. And so um, I've never been more intimately um, uh, involved in the creation of a piece. You know, David wrote this music before we ever met. David but, Byrne, yeah. yeah, yeah. But once we got in a rehearsal room with Alex and, and we started telling stories and, 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 and perspectives about what, what, you know, the stories that we were telling, um, I, I feel very much my DNA is in this piece. Um, and I've been part of this project um, every step of the way. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. Tell me more about that, because this is the first time I've heard that, that the, the show came together, I guess the script came together based on a, a collaboration of personal stories from those of you who either lived through it or, or were directly descendant of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, what was that like? I mean, so you're coming in to audition for a role that they don't really know how to tell yet is. Yeah. Is... I mean, like, you know, cause the original concept album, there was really, there was only one Marco song, which is the big song, the perfect hand song that, that has stayed with the piece. But in the concept album, there was no Aquino song. There wow. really wasn't, you know? And so, because the original concept album focused almost entirely on Imelda and Australia, the the the, the nanny, the, mm -hmm. the housekeeper nanny that, that, you know, she grew up with. Um, and that was pretty much the primary focus. It was almost all their songs. Um, and there were four, three songs that, that, that are no longer part of the show, but were basically Imelda when she was a child. And, and so when, you know... When to, to to transition from concept album to theater piece, and once you have Alex Timbers along and you, Oscar Eustace at the Public Theater, who's like the, the king of dramaturgs, you know, I think he when they were beginning to shape it, they realized the story that that they wanted to tell was this triangle. Was it had to involve Marcos a little bit more than 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 there was on the concept album, and it definitely had to bring in Nino Aquino and and make him a pivotal part of the story um because he wasn't part of the original concept album and so i think um sharing my stories with my family um you know and i think just understanding uh, the uh, the the background of and also to understanding too that there's there are different perspectives from people who stay in the philippines and live through martial law and people like myself and my family the filipino americans who left and raised their kids as philippine as americans and and here we are trying to find perspective on, you know, on, on our f Filipino history from different sides of the Atlantic, of, of the Pacific. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I think um, this, like I've, I've always said that Here Lies Love is a testament to the workshop process, that every step of the way from that first workshop at the public in 2011, even before I was involved, 
you know, that he David um, uh, had that concert in Carnegie Hall, and I think he he realized that was not the direction he wanted to go. And though, and then when he finally got connected with Alex and Oscar Eustace at the Public Theater, then it became a theatrical piece that was coming closer and closer to what it, what David always had in mind, which was telling the story in a disco. Uh, you know, I can't imagine being in that room that like 15 years ago, and he was like, I want to tell a story in, in a disco setting, and you're like, oh sure, that that'll never that'll never fly. Um, I'm going to tell the story of martial law and it, with karaoke yeah, and disco. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was just, it, we had that first workshop and it was, at, it was in the little tiny black box at NYU. Um, there were only, I believe, nine actors. Um, and we, we just literally did the first eight songs of the show. And at that point, there, the first eight songs were still three songs when Imelda was young. Um, and then we, we didn't get to, there was, and the Ninoy character had this, new song that never that didn't last past that workshop <laughs> um it was definitely an experiment uh, that song and it didn't pass uh, that experiment and um i remember that first workshop ended with uh the line dance um and the wedding i, I don't know I, it was but it was bizarre right and i everyone everyone felt like something was interesting but it wasn't it hadn't fully formed what it was yet you know and then a couple months later, we uh, I got a call saying we're going to do a second workshop, but we're going to keep going with the next eight songs in, hmm. in, in the cycle. And I walked into that room, and there was maybe just one or two people who were there from the previous workshop, including Ruthie. Ruthie and I were both found for that first first workshop. Uh, and then there was a whole slew of other people. There was a new Ninoy. And, and so it, every step along the way, they made huge strides. And then that second workshop, I believe Peter Negrini and the projections got more involved and... Um, and we just really started thinking, oh, this, this, this telling the story in a stand in and in basically like in, even in the black box in, in NYU, we were standing amongst the, the invited audience. They, they invited 30 people in that little black box and we were telling the story around them. And I had this little camcorder in my hand for perfect hand, <laughs> and, you know, and I, it, it was bizarre, but it, it was the, it was the genesis of where we are now. And, and, I consider it an absolute privilege that like as an actor that I have distinct memory of, of every step of the way of, of this piece and the, the, the mistakes and the, the trials and the, the experimentation that happened between 2011 and now. Um, and uh, it's such a thrill to be able to see it finally reach the finish line. And, and, and so uh, Mass Mocha, when we went to Williamstown Theater Festival and presented the full piece there, was a huge uh, leap forward in terms of the the understanding what the piece was. You know, Corins, Dave Corins came in and built this behemoth of a set. Uh, the platforms were much taller in Mass Mocha. They were like like shoulder height. Oh, really? Um, ultra dangerous and <laughs> ultra heavy. Um, and um, and I think that was in, in itself was really experimentation. And and we had only seven performances at Mass Mocha. And even then, we still had those three songs in the beginning. Um, and I remember when we moved to the public the next year, Oscar Eustace basically said, cut those three songs, get to the point, let's get to Manila right away. You know, And I think it's stuff like that that was like, at first we're like, we're cutting three songs, oh no. But it changed everything to finally get to the point of the story. And um, and, and Clint Ramos has been involved with it even before that. and and. And Annie B. Parsons, like just to, to, to like to do her choreography and all the different iterations is just been a thrill. When did Leia come in as as a producer? I believe for the Broadway production, I think her name was was thrown. I mean, again, I'm only speculating because obviously I'm, it, I was involved in those talks. But from what I gather, uh, you know, when when the rumblings were happening uh, and the rumblings have been happening on and off for the past 10 years. Right. Yeah. Um, but the the, tr the latest rumbling started uh, mid COVID because there were there were plans to have th that were very serious uh, January of 2020. I got a phone call in January of 2020, and it's like this this is happening, and we're gonna we're revving up for later in the year or next year. Wait, was this and was this pre or post January 6th? Oh, uh, post that that's pre that... pre pre pre. Oh. No, January 6th happened while we were in COVID. I'm talking about. Before COVID, we were we were all. Set oh, you were ready to to you were okay. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So January twenty twenty, we were all ready to go, um, and then COVID happened, 
And, you know, and it was one more thing. It like, cause like we were almost ready to go in 2017. We were almost all ready to go in 2014. And every time there was, you know, just the, 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 it just didn't happen, you know, and, and for a plethora of reasons, but, um, Leia became involved, I believe, um, you know, after the talks began again in after COVID, um, I think uh, the producers now, and at this point, Jose Antonio Vargas and Clint and has joined the producing team and, and Clint Ramos went from, um, from being our costume designer only to also one of our lead producers. Um, I think there were big conversations about like, how can we, what can we do with the show that will, that will reach out to the Filipino community? Um, and obviously uh, um, the dream was to have Leia involved in some capacity. And I think um, her coming in as the guest artist for Aurora is, was a stroke of genius because every night when she sings that song, it brings down the house and it, and it solidifies what we always know and just the importance of that song. Um, and the fact that we are putting such an important song in the hands of the legend that is Leia Salonga, that, that is purposeful and that resonates with the audience. Um, and, and then she, I believe when she came on, um, the, the, they, 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 they began talking about whether she wanted to come on as a producer as well. And, and having that, hmm. or not her just being as a, as a performer, but as a producer, um, really resonates with a lot of Filipinos, particularly the Filipinos who are in, are in Manila and not, who are not Filipino American, but, but specifically just Filipino. Um, it, it, it's, it legitimizes the show in a way that's very specific and personal, uh, to people who have any doubt that we, that the show might be something that is, um, uh, not respectful to the Filipino culture and, and not um, honoring our history or honoring um, the way we want to tell the story. I I was going to ask about the, I guess, just making it personal, because it seems like every everywhere I read, there is another cast member coming out with their own story that, um, or f people coming in and getting attached to it who have these backstories and these experiences with um, with being first generation, um, or, or immigrating themselves or like, mm -hmm. like yourself, that their family literally is a product of the story that you're telling, retelling eight times a week. And so right. I guess like for your own kind of mental health, right? You're playing mm -hmm. somebody that so many people most accurately and appropriately despise. Right. And... I mean, he is a real dick, Tater. And, uh, <laughs> see what I did and and so I guess now, I, I, well, there's multiple parts of this question because I'm kind of all over the place in what I am thinking. But for you playing a bad person, mm -hmm. again, your parents come to see it. And this is kind of what I was getting at originally was like, are they able to separate the person that you're playing from you? or Because I, I hear stories sometimes of actors who play bad people on TV and then right. people come, fans come up and they're like, I hate you. You suck. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, is is and, that and is that there at all? That, that happened, um, that did happen. And, and something that Alex Timbers um, decided to do uh, helped shift that. Um, first of all, it, 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 it still happens. Um, and and I, I am fine with that. You know, if, if you come to our, sh our show and you leave and you see me on the street and you're and my portrayal of Marcos makes you that uncomfortable, then I think I've done my job. Yeah, I think I've, I that is fine. I, I have plenty of other people in my life who can show me love. <laughs> I it, Someone who comes to the theater and, and sees me portray Marcos and decides to not want to talk to me and kind of hate me from afar. <clears throat> I'm cool with that. I'm absolutely cool with that. Um, you know, uh, one thing that Alex Timbers did, because like the first week of previews, um, there were situations where in the curtain call, I would come out for my bow and the, the, the applause would diminish. Wow. And there were definite, there was a definite feeling in the audience of we don't want to applaud this guy. And it hurt, it, 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 that's hard to be honest as an actor and you're, you're, you're finishing your show and you, and you're, and you're taking your curtain call. Um, and then later a couple, and then 20 minutes later, I'm leaving the stage door and I see people literally like recoil when, when I come out that hurt, but that's fine. Like I said, if I've done my job, but Alex Timbers said, you know, we're going to change that. You know, I think we want you guys to bow as your, as the actors that you are, not the characters that you just portrayed. So he had, it was a very simple change. 
Conrad Rikamora and I changed from our character costumes into street clothes. Well, not street clothes. They're basically like contemporary clothes uh, in the same color scheme. Like mine are still black and he's in still still in white, but they we're not Marcos and we're not you know, Ninoy in the curtain call. Um, and it made a huge difference. Wow. It made a huge difference. And they also added Conrad, Ariel, and myself and Leia to the final song, uh, God Draw Straight. Um, and we all are basically take it as you will, you either see us as um, ensemble village people, um, but it's a separation. We, we, we are no longer Imelda, Ninoy, and Marcos. We are part of the ensemble, part of the cast. And then the curtain call is after that. Um, it's, it's, it was very helpful for me to do that because then I got a warm response in my curtain call as opposed like people were applauding, thankfully, the actor and not the character that I was playing. Um, and I could feel it instantly when I left the theater um, at the stage door. Um, but, you know, at le- listen, I'm okay playing a villain. I've played villains in the past. It's, it's, it's okay. It, they're, they're sometimes the, they're the, they're the juiciest parts. Mm-hmm. They're, they're sometimes, um, and he is the villain of my family history. You know, my, my parents would tell me stories about him and, 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 and his the the trail of death and and destruction that this man has left behind is is still being felt today yeah um and and researching this part you know i i yes i researched him even though his his recorded history is so full of falsehoods and and invented truths and because that's just how he played he played a he was a smart man who who knew that he could write his own history so he wrote this journal every day that was semi-true so like when they found his journal people were like dates are wrong like he wrote it but like he but he even him writing in his daily journal knew that someone was going to find it someday so he would like invent things in his journal like this is how this man thought um and so this this kind of self-important i'm gonna make a mark in this world arrogance and ego um I had I didn't have to look any further than like looking at contemporary examples like Trump and and Putin. Yeah. You know, it's like it's real and like that's the same version of these people, these men usually, but these people exist in cycles in in history. Like it's the same. They I mean uh, they're all the same. They're literally all the same. Mm-hmm. And so um in terms of what I played differently, I think Conrad and I have both have been asked frequently because we are reprising roles that we played 10 years ago. Um, we both have gone on to, to play other roles in between the two projects and that have only strengthened what we do. Like I went to go play the King of Siam for a couple of years and, mm-hmm. and I think finding the strength and power of, of being the King, um, has only helped me find the ego, um, of, of, of playing Ferdinand, um, and, and being a little older and being uh, more secure and not needing to, um, eager to please like maybe as I was when I was younger. Um, and I think um, my confidence in the piece has only increased in the 10 years since we did it the first time. We're gonna take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. So um, I think playing the villain is fine for me. Um, uh, my dad has a harder time than my mom. My mom, I'm, I'm always going to be my mom's little boy. And so she's easier. She she sees me more easily as her, her son playing a part. Yeah. But um, but my dad, you know, I, I my dad, I sometimes I get a little angry at politics and I, I'm the kind of guy who curses at the, the, the television when when something on the news happens. I get that from my dad. You know, I <laughs> he's a hot he's a hot headed <laughs> activist. And, you know, he was at those protest rallies a lot more than my mom was. And so, um, you know, I think he he's proud of me and he and he's proud that we're telling the story. Um, but uh, it's hard for him sometimes to know that 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 his handsome young boy is going around playing the guy that he hates. So but the silver lining, I think, is that you're by playing this guy that he hates, you're you're coming uh, you're bringing to light you're you're bringing to the surface a story that so many people, myself included, did not mm-hmm. know before. Yeah. I mean, or maybe we had 
heard a little bit of or something yeah. over like, oh man, this is January 6th insurrection. Well, that almost happened, but it didn't. So we're okay. Like right. we're not because just yeah. like you said, exactly, it, it's going to happen again and again and again. So we need to know how right. to deal with it and we need to learn from the past. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, I'm watching like I, just this morning I was watching, uh, you know, obviously Trump is being indicted to get, again today and he's being showing up to the court. The, his playbook that he's been having, the whole insurrection, the, January 6th, the playbook with January 6th, if you, if you do the research that I've done and looked up all the different attempts that Marcos made to stay in power when he realized he, he was in the middle beginning of his second term as president, mm -hmm. he only had four years left. He he literally was like, maybe we'll change to a parliamentary system and I'll and I'll name myself prime minister. Then I could be prime minister forever. You're like he literally had all these options because he was petrified that once his second term ended, that he would be useless and not and not be able to run for president again. And so he created all these situations where uh, there were riots. He he really he there was a bombing, and he 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 said the bombing was done by this party, even though the vast majority of people who were killed in the bombing were of that party, you know. <laughs> and so, and so he wanted to create all this this mayhem and violence so that he would have to declare martial law. And if you're looking, if you're listening closely to all this Trump stuff and all this January sixth and the fake electors, they were expecting January sixth to happen. Yeah. They were looking. They were expecting it to happen so that someone had to declare martial law. Yeah. And that was one of his options. Have, and so like when 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 I when people say like, oh my God, things that happened in the Philippines in, in 1970, that'll never happen. Any well, it's happening all over the place. And it's a playbook that that dictators and wannabe dictators know works. And so um the sad truth though is that, you know, once Marcos was kicked out of the Philippines. It didn't mean a lot of his supporters were not still in power in different forms of in different levels of government in the Philippines. The most important people that were in power were the people who were in charge of the educational system. Mm. So a bunch of Marco supporters have been in charge of the educational system in the Philippines for the past 45 years. And because of that, if you look at the textbooks and history books that have been taught to the public school system in the Philippines during ever since martial law, they don't talk about martial law. So you have entire generations of Filipinos who martial law is something that their grandparents talk about, but they don't know anything about it. So now this guy is running for president and the only thing they have to, to know about martial law is on Facebook because 99% of the Filipinos are on Facebook now. They don't watch the news. They only click on, it's, it's, it's maddening. So what's, is there any mention of the people power revolution in these textbooks? Yes, but then they then they they kind of gloss over what the People Power Revolution was for. You know, it was like oh, they they toppled a government that they didn't agree with anymore. But it, 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 the the fact is that like martial law and and the the horrible things that happened in martial law and the billions of dollars stolen has not been taught, and so now you have these young people who are in their twenties and thirties and forties who have grown up with social media. Um, are being spoon-fed false information about what what those years were but were about, um, and that's exactly how Marcos Bung Bung Marcos got re got elected, um, and it's it's a it's a it's part of the playbook of you know if and I always want to recommend it Maria Ressa who's the Nobel Prize winning uh, Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, journalist who founded Rappler.com she she lays it all out in her book it's called How to Stand Up to a Dictator. And it's about the Duterte election and how Facebook is ravaging uh, the educational system and it's ravaging uh, Filipinos' ability to make good decisions about who to elect to office. Um, and it was a huge, huge help in my research about understanding, yes, I'm playing a guy who you know, took over the Philippines 50 years ago, but, um, but it could happen again. And, and trying to understand where Filipinos are today um, why my parents who are retired um, look at the Philippines now and, and the government there and are just frustrated because they're, they're just exhausted by the whole thing. Because um, all the work that they did 60 years ago, it's, it's kind of all crumbling. Well, even locally, 
in in our own yeah. country now in in America. If you had not said you were talking about Marcos, I would have I could have assumed any <laughs> number of different people actively in the news today. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. and that's just sad. I, it's interesting, and I, I want to get your your kind of educated guess on this. But I just finished mm -hmm. a podcast yesterday, um, about called Run Hide Repeat, about uh somebody's whose entire family up until I think their late thirties was disrupted by this guy, um, who had he lived this complete delusion his whole adult life, and. Uh, it's called um it's a type of psychotic disorder called delusional disorder very simply put where you you literally make up this entire elaborate story about what what is happening and it could be something like all oh, the like i'm being spied on so i can't have i can't go in this room because there's right. spy things here but anyway like so they move their family around canada their entire child child life because all of a sudden they were found and then they had to move again right wow. and then everybody else in that circle starts to believe it so wholeheartedly because it's so in, it's so seemingly impossible that it becomes it, it's not totally what am i trying to say right. it's it's okay. it's improbable but it's not impossible and right. so everyone, love, there's always they're, a they're shred of line, truth their baseline of truth has been shifted so so often that yeah. that they can't see beyond what that baseline has right been. so my i guess my question for you then is is people like marcos or even like our former president or putin or whoever it is is it do you think there's a part of a delusion that's there where they genuinely believe it? Or is it all ego where they just have to, or a combination of the two, right? Where they just oh, have to be like. It's definitely a combination of the two, you know, and I think it's, it's a good also to, a reminder that our show actually is about Imelda. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. That is true. And, and I bring that up because she is the perfect example of delusion. Um, and I think um, if, 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 if a psychologist or a psychiatrist actually sat her down and talked to her, there's a level of delusion that, that would kind of classify her as slightly deranged in mm -hmm. the sense that she truly believes. And I, I don't think it's ego necessarily, but she truly believes that it's that she was placed on this earth by God. Well, it's like her reference, people like that around them, their reference is so shifted that that's what they have to believe because they don't know any different. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I, I, I've always felt that between, if I had to compare Marcos and Imelda, Imelda comes from a little bit of a delusion where she was this molded clay that was shoved in directions and it, and it created a world for her that was a creation of delusion basically. Um, Marcos, I don't think was delusional. I think he was more calculated. And I think he, I think he was a criminal, yeah. you know, and I, I think one of the one of the things that people uh, that even amongst them, the many people who have different differing opinions about Marcos. It is a fact that when he was young, as a young, young man living in the northern province of the Philippines, his father was a politician. His father was running for mayor against a rival. The rival won. Marcos and his uncle killed that rival yeah. and then was sent to jail and prison. While he was in prison, he got his law degree, Marcos, and stood before a judge and convinced the judge to let him off. And the judge literally wrote down, this man is so smart and so charismatic, we cannot let him rot in jail. He must be let set free to be be someone important for this country to leave. It's lead. a snake oil salesman. It's absolutely. So like that is literally the genesis of who, uh, so Marcos basically learned very young in life, I can do what the hell I want as long as I can get myself out of it. You know, and and he was one of the he was always one of the smartest people in the room, and he he had like a he had a he had a photographic memory. He could memorize speeches. He would, so like, so when I see when I compare Marcos and Imelda, Marcos is always smart and calculated, and Imelda is kind of like the delusional like. Everyone tells her she's beautiful. Everyone tells her that she's put on this earth to be gorgeous, and so there's two very different despots here you mm -hmm. know like two very different approaches to the world and i think what's beautiful about here lies love is that we get to live in that world of imelda and imelda's world is that disco you know where she takes these 
trips with these world leaders and she gets hurt by Marcos and she goes, you know, and allows me from my character study for, for Marcos, I, I, I try to control her as much as I can. And I try to control the situation as much as I can. And that's what I do when I'm on stage. Um, but uh, the frustrating thing with Marcos is that he got sick and that he was not able to keep control. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, to answer your question, I think I don't think he was delusional. And, but I think it was a, it was a lot of ego. Marcos was was walking ego. And I think I, I don't compare him to Trump as much as I compare him to Putin. Yeah, I, I think Putin that. is definitely someone who is smart, uh, who has the ego and the need for power. He's been he's had power now for a very long time um, and he doesn't want to let go. Um, and I think and I think also, too, and I, I don't want to play into conspiracy theories here, but I think he's also sick right now. And I think um, I think he's there's a lot of stuff that's trying to cover up that he is. Um, and so, I mean, so I think the the when I try to make connections to contemporary leaders, um, Putin is so easy to to uh, to connect to, um, particularly they're like photos of of themselves bare chested on horses and working out in gyms that Marcos had bears taken. Yeah. So here's that famous yeah. picture of what Putin on a bear or whatever. I don't even know if that's real. I, I, <laughs> I need a, I need a Snopes.com that one. Uh, yeah, th it's, this is fascinating. You're right. And the show does center around Imelda and, and you're absolutely right because the beginning of, of Here Lies Love, like it goes through the whole beauty pageant scene because it, people, and especially women of that time um, are, are treated in a certain way absolutely. and then they only find their value by continuing Again, it's you're you're presented with a reality, and if you have no perspective on how it can mm -hmm. be different, and there was no social media, there was no internet, really at that point, right? And right. and that's all you know, and you're like, if you're told your entire life, well, you have to be pretty to stay relevant, and mm -hmm. then you have no ability to make decisions to keep power other than just like, yeah, right. you see what I'm saying? It's like I totally yeah. see how she became delusional, especially when yeah. married to a complete psychopath. Absolutely. And and then they had access to all the money they ever wanted. Yeah. And they were basically told you can do whatever the hell you want to do. I mean, that what that what that does to someone's psyche and not to not to let her off the hook. I mean, the woman is deplorable. Like she she's she chooses to live in her delusion. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think I think it's 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 it's, it's I, I don't want to say that she's delusional, to, to, in, but by any means to let her off any hook here like the woman is is calculating the woman knows who she is the woman knows the money that they stole um there's a part of her that that knows it's stolen but it's still hers <laughs> <laughs> like i um, earned it because i stole it i mean normal people don't pack diamonds in diaper bags when they're leaving their house like just it, it's just hey, speak for yourself you know <laughs> there's a level of criminality there that's, that's just in plain sight here you know like if you thought it was really yours why are you hiding jewels in diaper bags when you're leaving the i just didn't so things like that are just um and the, what's frustrating too and the same way like this morning i'm watching the news and and 70 percent of gop voters still believe that trump is innocent you know i mean mm. like there is uh, there's a level to me like that when i see people who are still massive marco supporters um it 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 it's still it's it's frustrating because you like you said like there's these people live in a different reality they they live in a different world where they've been told a falsehood so often and their grandparents lived it and their parents lived it that it's their baseline we're going to take a short break stay tuned for more of the episode Marco's support in the Philippines has never waned. I kind of call it, it's not dissimilar to like, kind of like the, the white supremacy problem in America where it's never gone away. It's just they just didn't talk about it. Right. Um, and now with Trump back in power, they've just found they're more empowered to say things out loud than that than uh, the things that they always thought but never talked about. The Marcos supporters are finding that power right now. Like they've been here forever. They've been around since Marcos was kicked out, now they can finally go, go to a party and go, oh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been a Marcos supporter for since since they left 40, 50 years ago. Um, and that's what's frightening. 
that is that is what is the most frightening yeah. because those people um, have maintained positions of power both in the Philippines and in America. Because yeah. a lot of people came to America with suitcases full of cash. You know, when 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 they could tell that Marcos was about to be kicked out, there were planes full of Filipinos who were like, "Let's get the hell out of here! Take take all the suitcases of cash that Marcos gave us to keep quiet, and let's go buy a house." in in america and not talk about it for anymore um there are a lot of people who got very wealthy off the marcuses and 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 to be honest a lot of their kids and grandkids have no idea so you know and so there are there are populations of filipino americans who are here second third generation who you know had a nice head start as immigrants you know they came here and were able to buy a house right away and go to go to private schools maybe and they they've never asked their parents how, 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 what what made us so well off when we came to America because they just didn't want to talk about it. Or maybe they know and they don't, or they have an idea and they don't want to know because then it would exactly. mean that they can't enjoy it. Which is why sometimes it's hard for a lot of people to talk about the show and because you know whether or not you were for Marcos or against Marcos, martial law was a traumatic experience for everybody except the rich people. But like it was a traumatic experience, you know, it's, and. And no matter how well it ended with the People Power Revolution, there was still 20 years of trauma involved in it. And um, I have to remind myself of that, that as much as, as as good as it is that we're telling this story and we're getting people to talk about it, um, it can be very hard for some people yeah. to talk about. It. I can't believe it was 20 years, though. I mean, because in another multiverse, another version of the multiverse... January 6th was successful and we have a dictator right. in America, right? And right. it would just be the beginning. We've had, we had four years, thankfully not eight. And mm -hmm. I, God, 20 years. I remember I was, I was 23. How old am I now? I was 22. And <laughs> I can't remember how old I am. I was 22. I had the world ahead of me. The Everything was great. And I cannot imagine going through the last 20 years just fearful to walk outside. Like that's that's really serious stuff. And I'm yeah. I'm just like I'm thankful to you and the cast and everybody for educating us dumbass Americans, spe yeah. speaking for myself, um, on these stories that happen outside. Because even in America, like again, the the victors write the history books, but right. we we learn very little, even in public school growing up, I learned so little about international history. And right. then on the news well, today, there's so much to learn. Right. yeah, there's well, so much to learn. Well, like, and, the, and also to the things that, that I've had to learn as a Filipino American, um, which clearly I was not taught in American schools, was the, the enormous Filipino, uh, sorry, the enormous American interference and involvement in, at the at the beginning of Filipino creation filipino government hmm. like we went from being like the joke is the state that is that we filipinos were not a country at all until the spaniards came we were we were basically a, a bunch of island tribes that traded with each other and spoke different languages mm -hmm. right? and then spain came and said look at all you people living near each other we're going to call you a country we're going to name you filipinos after king philip of spain and we're going to be in charge for the next 400 years we're going to make you catholic and we're going to systematically rename all of you from your tribal names to Spanish names, right? So for 400 years, we were a colony of Spain. And then suddenly when Spain's colonizing started, you know, falling apart, the Americans came in and said, we'll free you, but we're going to be in charge, yep. you know, and we're going to give you a government that's basically a copy and paste of our constitution. But every president that you elect is going to be the guy that we want because we need you guys to let us have these three naval bases here forever and ever. And so like, if you look at the history, like the Filipinos don't really celebrate the first four presidents of our history because they were, they were kind of just little figureheads. Yeah, my mom, that'll kill me for saying this, but like they were basically, you know, Amer American military pawns. They were, they were there as like, Oh, he'll get elected president, but we control him, which is exactly why when Marcos got elected in 1965, the, the, the Philippines was still a very young country. We were only really independent for like, you know, six, 50, 60 years at that point. He came in with this whole notion of nationalism and said, we are Filipinos. I'm going to stand up for us and we're going to get this and get that. And people like my parents who were freshmen in college in 1965 were like, this guy, 
He's smart. We're going to vote for him. Hmm. You know? And he won in a landslide. And then within just four years of his first term, turn, things turned so sour and m so much money was stolen. And, and it radicalized a lot of young people like my parents and said, this guy's dangerous. And then boom, two years after that, martial law was declared. So it's like, it can, it can happen so quickly. Um, so, so quickly. Um, but, but most Amer most Filipinos don't understand the, the involvement of American, uh, politics and, and, and military in, in, in Filipino history. Um, you can, which is why we start the show with American troglodyte. Like you can't talk about Filipino history without talking about American involvement. Like the first line we say in the show is, did you know that the Philippines sold, um, bought the Amer America from the Spanish for $20 million? Yeah. That's exactly true. Yeah. It's exactly true. You need to be an adjunct history professor at some <laughs> somewhere around here. Like I had no clue this episode was going to go this deep into history. And I feel like I could continue to talk for another like <laughs> five hours. Like this has been so, so enlightening and uh, well, thanks. It's it's phenomenal. I love learning this stuff, and that would make my parents very proud that you said that. It's it's it was also just twelve years of research for a job. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But still, and, it, you're passionate it's, about it's, it. It's very personal, right? Like I I love that I've done all this research, but it's be, but it's it's like I I I was embarrassed. I said, you know, t ten years ago, I said I should know more of this. Like I. I'm an I'm an adult Filipino American man. I need to know more of my history. Like, why don't I know enough of this? And so I've hopefully found out more and 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 had a better perspective on on the whole thing mm. and be able to talk about it is is, is really important. Well, I think you should teach. I don't know. <laughs> do, do do some. You could do uh, like a a weekly or a semi like every couple days or something. Like just post a little a little history lesson on TikTok, you know, or right. or on Instagram Reels. I don't know somewhere That's where you're like it. your Filipino fact of the day. <laughs> that would be cool all right so let's wrap up the episode with Great. uh three questions i ask everyone to close it out um just the very the very first question simply is what motivates you uh what motivates me is my family um and uh making them proud and my husband making him proud i think um the older i get and the more i work um it becomes less about uh, my own personal ego and, uh, things like opening night. I had them all there for opening night and, uh, and I live for, for making my sister proud making my parents proud and making my husband proud. Hmm. I can tell it comes through with everything you're talking about. Yeah. What advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? Uh, relax. <laughs> I think, uh, Again, I always, I always kind of, uh, I always think it's a good thing and a bad thing that my, my the, the immigrant mentality of like time is running out. You got to, you got to do everything. I think I spent way too much of my twenties stressed out about time, and um, and 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 not getting the right this and not doing the right that, and and um, I think I didn't enjoy myself as much. Um, I think even when when things were going well, I was stressing out about the next job, mm -hmm. um, and I think I've, I I would tell them to to stop and enjoy where you are even if it's not perfect but there's always something to learn about where you are so beautiful okay last question hardest one if you can see only one show for the rest of your life but you can see it as many times as you want what would you see oh we're talking about a musical theater show like, sure what, interpret what, it how you will but we'll go with musical theater since you said that oh okay um wow god i got that is hard you know what? I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back on the show thing. I'm gonna see a movie. Okay. And it's and it's it, and it's a movie that 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 um, I, I I go back to over and over again. And it's um, when Harry met Sally. <laughs> <laughs> it's Any weird. It's particular the, scene? It's just it was one of the first movies I was obsessed with as a kid, uh, and it, it was very New York to me. Um, and it was about you know growing being being an adult in New York. And every time I revisit that movie, I'm a different age gap age age break you know I, I watched the movie as a teenager and then i was a, i was a 20 something and then i was a 30 something and now i'm a 40 something and different parts of that movie read to me and it's about friendship it's about relationship and it's about new york um and it and i think that movie is one of my go-to like if i need to relax like it's I, it's on my phone i bought it on amazon years ago and i can just play it whenever i want hmm. so there I, you go that's a good point there aren't a lot of love letters to new york anymore in movie really form. Not. Yeah. They're also cynical. Like why who wants to write a love letter to New York? But I I my favorite New York 
feeling is especially when i when when you leave new york because it's always good to leave new york and come back yep but i always look forward to the cab ride from the airport going into the city because when that when your cab is going over the hill and you see the skyline for the first time i know exactly what you're talking about yeah whether it's the daytime or the nighttime the second you see the skyline like my shoulders drop and i'm like all right i'm home no matter what time of day i can go get a bagel if i want it yep it's fun Order breakfast 24 seven. That's all you need to know. Bagels and breakfast. All right. Where can we find you on social media? Um, the Jose Lana, T H E J O S E L L A N A on Instagram. And, uh, what is it? It's not Twitter anymore. It's X. X. (laughs) Okay. And, uh, (laughs) my, my thought, speaking of weird dictators, (laughs) right. And thread, I guess thread or threads. Threads. Yeah. Yeah, you oh, you you post. Are you threading? Do like when you post? Are you threading? I haven't figured I that mean, out. I mean, the yet. best thing is that it's attached to Instagram, right? So uh, I guess I don't know. Um, I like but... I like threads right now because they don't. I don't know if I, it's on their feet their roadmap to implement this, but you can't sort by or uh, um, filter by hashtags, mm. right? So if you put hashtag whatever, it's not a link like it is on on Instagram. Uh-huh. So like bots can't find you. They you don't get the spammy comments. You like are actually following people. So I've had some pretty meaningful stuff on threads. I like I guess it. that's 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 a good design. Yeah, I like that's it. it. I like it a lot. Well I'm on Instagram and X. This is the first time I've had to say that. Ew that, that sounded yeah, so gross. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. I was on Twitter, now I'm on X Threads, Facebook, uh listen and leave a review wherever you're listening. Um Jukebox the Ghost gave us our intro outro music and uh Jose, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this chat. Same day. Thanks so much. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.